Hello, welcome to another edition of Low Code Campfire. This is episode number 132 for February 2nd, Groundhog Day 2024. Today is an Open Lines Friday. I am Dale Warner, Head of Support for Plant and App, joined capably by Technical Success Manager Patrick Anderson for Plant and App. This is an event, an event we do every Friday, 10 a.m. Central Time. This hour we uh, we do an a uh, all skill levels welcome gathering to talk about Plant and App and uh, maybe any specific issues that you're facing. So please uh, jump in, do engage with us. All of these are put into YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash plant and app. So you can uh, watch them over and over again. We run the same agenda week by week. We'll do introductions for anyone new to the group, and then uh, we'll go around the campfire. We always do first call, and then we get to some of these other things uh, as, as the conversation leads us, and then after an hour or so, we go into afterglow. So do jump in, show and tell, bring a problem, uh, bring a solution. We have very few rules, but we like it if you're nice and if you've got noise in the background that you mute. You can submit questions and topics in advance. There are none of those for today, so uh, and nor do I have anything at all prepared since I've been on vacation for a week. So this is uh, free-flowing. We'll go wherever you want to go. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right, we're past that. We're all ready to first call. <laughs> While you think about whether you have something for first call, I'll just mention uh, I've, I've added a slide for um, uh, Patrick doesn't know that he's uh, going to be giving a master class later on in this. <laughs> so I did prepare. I, I I set Patrick up for success for today. But yeah, what do you got going on? Well, I saw M Matt unmuted, but then he muted again. <laughs> so I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> I've got a twitchy finger, but no, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good, I think. <laughs> okay. Hi, Dale. Jerry here. Welcome back. Why, thank you. I've really enjoyed the last few uh, sessions on the hierarchy. Uh, that's right up my forte. I hope to jump in and help design that if if you ever need more help at that uh genealogy type programming and parent child relationships is something that i consider myself an expert at so that's uh i'm really excited to see that that view come in and see how far we can take it and yeah you know, the challenge and see what we can do but <laughs> i've i've really enjoyed it and patrick went through while you were gone um we might we might take you up on that jerry uh, be yeah careful no there. worries no worries um <laughs> I've been doing that part for a long time, particularly where it relates to SQL and doing the right queries to be able to, you know, drill out tree structured type, uh, uh, tree structured type views on hundreds of thousands of records in the tree. That's where it kind of gets kind of crazy and how that works. But, uh, you know, it's one thing to do a parent child relationship on categories in a shopping cart where it's, eh, you know, it's kind of finite. But then if you had a, uh, a true genealogical situation, uh, say a particular company that might be a network marketing company that has thousands of people in their family group, uh, then that changes the whole uh, aspect and the way that you attack that algorithm to pull out yep. that, be able to traverse that tree. And then being so able I, also I, build, I'm build. guessing you're you're an expert at CTE, huh? <laughs> I am. I am. And, <laughs> and working around a CTE to where you're not using a CTE. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, I've, I've been, I, I don't want to drift far from our stuff, but I've been working with he, people that know more than I know about the hierarchy data type in SQL mm -hmm. and how can it outperform what I have been doing. And so far, we've not been able to find a way to use the hierarchy in SQL to really outperform it. But there's some clever people out there with some algorithms that I'm I'm going to go try out some of their work and see how that how that works to avoid using the CTE. But yeah, recursion, um, genealogy, parent-child, 
you're talking my language on that. So just anytime I can be of any assistance, I'm here for you. Um, with that said, Dale, welcome back. Uh, in one of your uh, personal emails to either myself or Dennis, you had made the comment somewhere about, well, Jerry, I hope when I come back, this has all been resolved. I'm referring <laughs> to the scheduler on, on our club. Yeah. It's perfect. It works like a charm. We're so happy. You just can't imagine how happy we are to have our automation uh, back online. And um, may maybe in the afterglow, we'll discuss uh what your engineers and we found and what we did to fix it. I, I don't think it's pertinent to to have on our campfire today, but at least we'll, all of our programmers will have it in a knowledge base that this could happen to you. And uh, in fact, I think I even mentioned it while you were gone last week in the campfire of what actually created that problem and, and how we and, went around fixing it. And since you mentioned the last campfire, I, I just wanted to, to um, point out that, for anyone joining and uh, just hitting on this one, uh, what are we on episode uh, 132? So last week's 131 from uh, one week ago would would have discussion about the hierarchy and um, the fact that we've put it out onto uh, Campfire and we have some other, um, we did it as a low-code cafe. So there's uh, these different um resources available to, to go into the details of that and you're you're getting it one week later so good and yes as far as the the other um I'm, i am glad to hear that it's resolved um at a at a high level we don't uh, if you just install plant and app the automation scheduler uh typically just works every other case we've ever seen but this was a site that grew up out of uh uh, lots of uh, through through a, a long time and uh, has other modules on it, so that's where the conflict came in. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, this would be considered possibly one of uh, our more, uh, and when I say our, I'm referring to everybody on this call. Legacy sites that's been around since the earliest of days, <laughs> maybe as far back as you know 1.0 or something. So yeah, so it was going going through all that. But our major conflict came from uh, two uh, a, a third party module not playing nice with our automation and um, uh, Planta App engineers figured that out. But the resolution to the fix was what was exciting. And, you know, uh, Dennis and I were kind of the liaison, the go-between between, between Plant the app and this third-party company. And, you know, he said, she said, fingers pointing and all this. And after a little bit of uh, uh, perseverance on Dennis's part, uh, the third-party person realized the error of their ways, fixed it, reinstalled, compiled, sent us a new one, and that automatically fixed Planet app's problem. I mean. And and it is it's just an interesting. It, I'm glad to hear that it's an interesting environment. When I mean DNN is a is, and I think I said this something like this in the ticket that DNN is one sandbox, and we all have to figure out how to play nice because uh, it is possible to impact the the operations of of uh, of other software. Lots of times it doesn't, but if if you've installed multiple modules then uh, from from different vendors. Now, now you get into that finger pointing. We hate it when it's finger pointing, right? We want to just yeah. all make it go. But um, well, no doubt that DNN being open source is a double edged sword for all of us. You know, it's a beautiful thing to share resources, and it's a horrible thing when somebody's resources tear up all of our other resources. But that's just the life we live in. And I just want to give you an update that uh, thanks to the Planta App crew. And helping us determine where the problem lies, we are good to go. And now I believe that we can take this legacy client and go ahead and advance them all the way up to uh, 1.25 and beyond without issue. Good. I, I know that's the getting everybody on current is always something that uh, this support guy likes it to be. So good. All right. What else? I saw a request come in through um, our uh, our support. I believe it was Mark that said it was trying to do some drag and drop stuff and have a little bit of logic and some uh, some things put into that. I, I want to offer my help on that. Um, it, it might have to be a private call, certainly beyond the scope of this call. 
But on the um, on the listings, drag and drop, when you move a record up and down, I I'm using you know SQL as a back end to update things depending on where you drop that record. And so quickly, what I would have done in that situation is all my rules would have been in that SQL query. So when I let go of the record, uh, if you just visualize I'm dragging something up or down in the in the uh, listing. If I um, let go of it in an invalid spot, I just don't update the database. I just don't allow it to happen. And then I do a data source refresh and it puts wherever I may have dropped it, it'll instantly put it right back to where it came from. So that that's my approach on doing those kind of things. And um, maybe that's just enough information there to get him started. But if I do need, if I need to help, I uh, just, Get me involved, and I'll be glad to help you out with that coding too. I'm trying to remember if we put an example of that out on Campfire, so I'll do that. But yes, um, you know, there was a time when you and I did uh, demonstrate how the drag and drop works, and in our particular case, we were um, uh, just having records sorted in a list and if you wanted to move, change the sort order you just basically drag the record to where you want it to be let go of it and the 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 code behind would simply uh reorder the the data and then do a data source refresh and that made it nice in this particular case uh we need to go one step further and say this is not a legal place to drop this record based on this set of business rules or this particular set of logic and and I have done that before. And the way that works for me is when I let go of the record, if it's not a good place to let go of it, then the SQL does not do the update. And we just return right back to the listing with a data source refresh and puts everything back to normal. And maybe I'm not sure if it would work or not, but I'd want to try it um, uh, for yeah, for Mark. I'd say maybe you could um, add a uh, toast message uh, that's conditional, that's based on the same condition that uh, gives some feedback on the in the UI um, saying that uh, that you can't drop there, something like that. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, Mark just arrived. <laughs> Are you guys talking about His ears about are burning. No, we were, yeah, <laughs> we were, we're talking about rough. your, your community. I apologize uh, for yeah. showing up late. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, I, I understand what you guys said. I, Jerry, I heard some of that about uh, giving feedback that that was not an appropriate place or an allowable place to be dropped. Um, I, that That's helpful. Um, can I can I show you guys quickly what I'm doing with this? Please. Sure. All right, are you seeing uh, best image? Mm -hmm. We are. Okay, so um, this is a photo contest um, and there's a judge putting uh, these these photos in order. This is the order that this, this contest has been judged so far. Um, take a look at the top three. They've been rated, they all have a score of 19. Um, that would mean, 19 by the way, is a very high score. So these three images at the top are tied for first place so far. Uh, I, I don't want there to be three first place winners. So my thought is I would grab a handle and drag it up and therefore that be, the one that I moved higher would then become um, maybe second place and the, the one below it would become third place. You see, you get the idea? Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, since this is a long list, um, and there's a lot of pictures in there. What I don't want a, a judge to be able to do is to move a fifth place into a first place. I only want them to be able to move a, a tie for third place a little bit above or a little bit below the other one that was tied for third place. Mm -hmm. And there might be another one where like there's a tie for fifth place with three images and I might want to let them be switchable within fifth place but in under no circumstances should a fifth place be drug up and become first it, it should only be drag draggable within the confines of a tie-breaking situation mm -hmm. 
So, um, so I heard Jerry, you say, uh, you know, dra let them drag it up, but then you give them feedback saying that's not a good spot. Um, it would seem to be a little bit, I'm thinking about the user's uh, interaction with that and their perception. They might be thinking, hey, this thing lets me drag it all the way up, so I'm going to put it in first place. And then I guess I would like it to, to only allow to be within the confines of the band of the, of the tied images. Like visually, oh. I want them to understand you can only go this far with an image. So, yeah. so Mark, um, I'm sorry. So Mark, there's, I, I mean, surely Dale and Patrick will have a, 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 maybe a better answer, but I see two challenges here. One challenge, we handle your business logic. And the other challenge that you just described to me is a programming, uh, is an actually change to how the um, uh, action listing handles the drag and drop. And that's going to, to me, that's going to be very difficult to do anything programmatically there based on your business rules, because you're the only person on the planet right now that has this scoring system and this imagery system and doing that. My system, the way I would attack this is when you let go of it. It, it would allow you to drag to the top, but this is how it works. The second you let go of it, the drag and drop functions fire and when you let go of it, if it's not a good move, then whatever update you have to do in the database to change that sort order to appear on this listing does not happen. So when you let go of it, yes, it'll drop it right there, but you do a data source refresh and it just puts it right back. And what Patrick was alluding to is in the middle of that process, you throw a toast message in there saying, I'm sorry, you can't move fifth place people into first place batch and, and mm -hmm. they try it again. Um, did I articulate that okay? I know that was a little goofy, but that's... Yeah. Um, you articulated just fine, and I get it. Um, yeah, you know, I I confess that I am usually quite concerned with the um, with the user experience, and I feel like that one is a little bit rough. Like, I should be able... I have a higher quality of stand. Like I, I want to do better than that. However... I get what you're saying about, you know, this is the way it works. So, so work with it the way it works. Um, I get that. So I, I might be able to, to do that and to work with it the way you suggest. I think a, a judge who, who tries to move a picture too far and gets that feedback will learn pretty quickly how far they can go and how far they can't go. So with their drag. What I was going to um, add to that is that um, you might consider putting your drag and drop if the rules really relate to only within a given place that you um, don't enable drag and drop until they're viewing first place, right? So they drill down to first place and they move things around within that and then that removes questions. I know it means another grid or, or another filtering. Um, Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm sorry. No, I didn't. So, so Mark, if you were to just isolate your first place people into one query, one grid, so now the grid doesn't have first, second, third, fourth, fifth place on it. It's only got first place on it. Then you could move around within that batch uh, without any of the stuff I mentioned. And if you needed to manage second place, you'd have to have a, a query that brought you just the second place people. What Dale was trying to articulate and was not commingling first to twentieth place onto the same grid. Have a, have the ability to come in and see that, but then if you need if you, you manipulate that, maybe you have to click something to get to isolate them down to just what you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought about having a a listing for first place, and it would be a separate listing for second place, and a separate listing for third, and I could stack them on the page, so they would only be draggable within first place and draggable within third place, whatever. Um, you know, a kind of, um, I like how clean this appearance is as far as they're all in order because they're, the judge is trying to, um, to, to, to have a first through sixth place winner 
and they would like to see it like lined up next to each other like this. I like this appearance and I don't want it in separate containers. I also don't like the way separate listings pop into the screen at different rates and they bump each other around as they're filling the page. And so I would like to avoid that. So so I it might sound like I'm complaining at, at your at your suggestions. I guess I'm not. I thought about that. I'm just looking for the the best of the best. <laughs> well, and and um what I was suggesting, for example, is if you um, just a, a, a an additional listing to do manipulation uh, to do the drag and drop. So, for example, instead of, on this one, instead of putting in a uh, putting the whole thing into drag and drop, having a a button that says um, that that they want to work on that place, whatever that I don't know what the wording would be for you, but the result being a pop up focused on place one or place two. It wouldn't, it would only have to be one additional listing that has the data source for um, for whatever place they pick and that one yep. being enabled for drag and drop. Sure, okay, so a pop-up and you drag it around in a pop-up and then you submit, the pop-up closes. And then, and then this listing goes back to showing what? The result. The result, yes, correct. Yeah. I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to give that some more thought. Okay. That's that that effectively reduces the drag and drop down to one place instead of multiple places. Yes, yeah. Simplified logic. Thank Good. you. Guys. Are you uh you can I take the share back from you? You got something else to show us? I am done. Thank you. I was Thanks, hoping... everybody. Sorry I was late. No, no. <laughs> there, there's no, we don't take attendance. Um, <laughs> I was going to just mention for anyone that it might be useful uh, in, that's a that's an ad, ignore that. <laughs> um, but in Low Code Cafe 58, and I'll put that on the, uh, I'll, we'll share that to the chat right now. Um, we, uh, covered drag and drop reordering and I think there's some uh, resources in here to talk about how to do reordering so if anybody wants to see uh, that and follow along let me put that out here um, go ahead Patrick did you have oh I was just going to say we we talked about um, the briefly on no. last week's call about no, uh, drag, and, no. drag and drop in the context of the hierarchy view <laughs> and um I just wanted to reiterate again for anybody who wasn't there that um, that the um, that the uh, the um, future and the specifically the PREV namespace means something different when you use a hierarchy view, and um, I think that's a little confusing, and and uh, and I think that we need to go back and you know. Uh, in in our product and, and take and re-evaluate um, that, but I just wanted to make sure that that's that you're aware of that. That when you're using a hierarchy view, you, it's actually not about changing the order of things; it's about um, assigning a new parent to an item. Okay. Yep. So just a a, a drag and drop note. <laughs> let's say. Thank you. I think that applies. Uh this area of listings. Um, so you've got a listing and you're looking at settings. Uh, again, just for people following along later, there's the drag and drop actions. And then this is where the work goes. So um, take a look at that uh, YouTube and look forward in this area. And that's interesting hierarchy view. Did you, uh, did you happen to demonstrate drag and drop within a hierarchy? Patrick? Uh, yeah, I used a, an example that I already had in place. I didn't build it while we Good. were talking, but I Good. used it. So also low code campfire then uh, episode from last week, 131. Yeah. Nice. What else? Well, guys, a quick addition to this conversation. I want to add that, uh, Chat GPT and I had to, had a conversation heart to heart mm -hmm. last night, and um, 
um, it, it became apparent that with some HTML added to those rows in a listing and the appropriate JavaScript that um, a person with who wants to put the time into it can create those bands within which things can be drug or not be drug within one of these listings. So um, I guess I could say we could extend that to work the way that uh, my requirements started. Um, I just want to say that out loud so that other people know, hey, I think you could accomplish things like this if you put in the time with the, the JavaScript. I'm not sure I'm willing to put in the time, but I see that it is possible. Yep. Yeah, that's all. Um... Yes, and I, I have I've been talking about that I have um, been accomplishing more by using something like ChatGPT to go beyond my my abilities, um, and specifically with JavaScript. And then there's the the caution that um, some things that you may be able to accomplish are are they going to be durable for you know, the next version and the next version of, of what we're, we release. It's just, it's a, it's a balance, right? Being able to get what you want versus is, is it durable long-term? And I, does that make sense? If, 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 if you were to use our listings and the, uh, and the HTML that we end up generating, and then we, um, make changes that could impact you in unanticipated ways just make you go back to uh to to impacting how you manipulate it but you might have to well taken yeah. yeah so that's uh, and and i think that's maybe a, a, a warning i don't know that i've made it before but i think it's just a, a, a common thing when you uh, interact with any of our things that's it's a possibility we try not to we're not arbitrarily changing things but it does mean that it's some a responsibility that you take on at the next version next release cool so uh patrick this is the one that i um was going to throw you under the bus with uh, you had a support issue that was that that I was uh, pointing one of our clients in an oh Ben's got his hand up so now we don't have to uh, <laughs> come in Ben talk to us Hello. no it was just a quick question um, it wasn't regarding what you were about to talk about if if I think you're gonna talk about what I think you are <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a quick question um, can I post a line of code uh, and have either you or someone who has access to 125 run it on an action form just to see what the result is. Because I don't have 125 yet, and I just want to see if it's the same behavior that I'm seeing on a lower version. Sure. You want to do... Um, let's... There's okay, so um, let's let's take a look at that. We can do a quick reproduction, but also there this one might be uh, this one might be something that I ended up revealing in another. It might be available. Is this on a button, or you need it? On, you need it. Um, uh, it's on the forms initialization scripts section. Okay. Because that area says that it supports tokens, but in the version that I'm using, it always returns negative one. That looks familiar. And I'm just curious to see if that's just because I'm in an older version and I don't have to worry about it moving forward, or is that something that I'm going to have to code around? Dale's got it worked out. That's true. But let's go check it. Okay. 
this took a while. I'm just going to throw a text box out here just so we can see it's visually see that it's loading. See a negative one. Yep. So it looks like it's still even in the latest version is the same situation. Is this something that um, previously worked? Uh, I Not that I've used in the past that I recall, um, but it's something that I was looking to institute now because of certain bootstrap issues that are cropping up. So I need to work around it. But what I'm finding is that obviously module ID doesn't work. And the code that I was writing for JavaScript, I only wanted it to apply to the current module. So if there were multiple action forms, I don't want it necessarily to apply to every single action form on the same page. So I need the module ID so I can scope it down to affect just the objects in that module. But module ID always returns negative one. So I don't know what the current module ID is. The only way around that at this point is you have to hard code the module ID into any of the scripting that you put in there and I'd rather not do that because I want to try to make it dynamic so that it's aware of the current module. Yep. So I'm wondering whether we get other, other tokens are available and they are. So date time worked module ID didn't. So there's something specific and, um, module module id token if we were to go and ask, actually let's put that in our text box so validating the token knows the answer so at the point of initializing the token it's a good value but at the point the javascript for some reason it doesn't know so i would doesn't know it yet yeah at the surface it seems like it's a bug i don't i could be argued about that one yeah but... i'm not i'm not going to turn around and say that it's not knowable at that point in time yet because there is another workaround where you could use JavaScript to pull out the module ID of the form element. It is there. It's, it's, a, it's a roundabout way of doing it, but then you have to put in the form's name to find that element ID of module ID, which basically boils down to the same thing. It's hard coding. Um, so you'd have to hard code the name of the form to then programmatically pull out the module ID of said form. But it, that, that is doable at that point. So at that point, the module ID is known because your system is writing it out as it's building the form. So I don't see why module colon module ID shouldn't be able to be aware of that as well at that point in time. I was I was wondering if we were going to get an event when this got got initialized and, and you don't so um, I was just trying to see if there's somewhere else that we could put it um, yeah so hmm. 
the answer is I don't know why this doesn't work and what other things do and don't work. Um, Yep, so you've got my curiosity going here a little bit. Now the tab ID. It's not the module ID. Seems like a little bug. Um, so we're, um, if you want to, I would say, if you want to, if you have, if you have a workaround, use it. Are you still there? It's off. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. My computer's been locking up and it makes me crazy. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you, find a workaround and you're happy with it, then great. If not, and you want to open it as a ticket, I'll be happy to ask the team to see if there's a, a way we can provide it. Um, yeah, you know, this this looks really familiar. I, okay. I think that you have covered this in a previous uh, something online. Didn't, and if I remember correctly, did, didn't you put this token inside another token and then that made it work? It was something like that. It was a little tricky trick you did that sort of nested that token inside something else and it worked fine. I would say you you addressed this probably a year and a half to two years ago. Well, let's... Play, uh... Good memory, Mark. Good memory. <laughs> this one, yeah, it, it, I needed the same, so it, it stuck in my head. <laughs> I don't remember where I used it. <laughs> Well, this looks promising. Hello, everyone. Your, your memory is better than mine. If you had if you have a syntax that you think we should try, I'd be happy to try it, but I can't remember. Well, it was either you put the module ID token inside a, a custom token, or maybe some kind of formula that involved oh. having the module ID. Okay, me. Well, that's an interesting idea. Let's let's. Do that. Let's... Let's if see. I remember correctly, this is something that you reported to the development team that this particular module ID token wasn't working correctly. And it's also like that's a that's a built-in DNN token, which is well, I guess a layer removed or a layer different. Yeah, I tried what you're doing and it still came up negative one. 
How about uh, evaluating it twice? Okay, interesting. Well, all right. Let's... Well, if we don't, if we don't work it out here, I know I'll put some effort into it because I'm fairly confident we we solved this before. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay. If you happen to find it, that would be great. And again, same way. And if you if you uh, want us to try and find the answer, if you'll open a ticket, I'll spend some time on it. Yeah. Okay. I'll throw some um, I did. I I posted the alternative method. If anyone cares to see it in the chat, um, but it's still a type of hard coding. You have to know the name of the form. Um, and then you could obtain the module ID. Um, I put it in actually as a feature request, but if you want, I could also put oh. it in as a ticket. Um, but... If you can th throw it in as a ticket, it's all, it makes it easier for me to follow up on. So sure. we don't work feature requests. We either do them or don't, but we don't work them. So it helps me. All right. That's exciting. Um, what an interesting nuance. And I can't believe that it, it bothers me that Mark says I figured this out and I can't remember it, but I guess, I guess that's pretty normal. I found something on the community. Um, says that um, it's a 1618 um, and uh, it points you to campfire to 2021 but um, the link isn't good it just goes to 2021 so <laughs> no, we're, let's see okay so you said in the forum yeah if you just type one? module ID in the search here oh yeah 1618 is the is the actual number yep And it was, in fact, more fuel thing. Yeah, this is why I was thinking it might be. Yeah, but that that link right there, that contribution link, doesn't work. But this is the the different uh, token though, because uh, the token that Vim was using is just module. This is module output. Oh. So I don't know. Anyway, does this ring a bell, Mark? Is this maybe what you were thinking about? That could be. Could be. There's module output, right. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not confident that that's the the one I was thinking mm -hmm. of. Yeah. That is different. All right. Today we're working on memory tests. Um, so Ben pretty well outed himself as the source of this ticket. So we, we're, <laughs> we'll, uh, oh, okay. One more. Matt has his hand up. We always go to polite people. I, <clears throat> thank you. So, um, I've been taking some of my, uh, tokens and kind of cleaning, tightening them up. So they, the input either relies on a parameter that's a session variable or a cookie. And when, you know, it, it comes back, like say a, a session variable expires, it comes, it sends a null value. I've got it nicely uh, working. So it says, do something like, please refresh your browser. And that's fine if you're using just the core, kind of the default return value in this case, say, the company name in the case of looking up a customer. Um, but when you do something like you want to uh, use the same, um, access the same invalid information, 
but you specify some other parameter, it doesn't, it kind of circumvents the, uh, it circumvents the error message that I've got set up and says, comes back with something like um, column, in this case, column partner ID does not belong ta to the table table, which is an internally generated message. So the question I have, is there a way to trap um, all of this to give a more coherent result back to the user instructing them what to do as opposed to kind of this default internal message on a token? So to uh, let me make let me rephrase. Make sure I've got the right scenario. You have a token that is um, using an input to to do something. Yep. Um, the result of that input is uh, it ends up being a and it breaks. Uh, it, it causes a SQL error. It sounds like in this case, and then it's returning the SQL error as the output of the token. Yeah, if you'd like, I can show you. Well, sure. That's that's always better than my imagination. <laughs> and All right. So, tell me when you guys can see this. Yep, we got okay. it. Okay. So if I I'm looking up customer information, and if I put in an invalid, either a zero value or in the case of say a an expired session it comes back with what i think to be a reasonably polite message but if i use the same uh parameters for the you know an invalid id number but i specify give me a specific value for that you know one of the column tables so to speak it always comes back with this is there any way to get it to play nice and have it come back with just the same I, or, you know, some message I, like this? I, I think there would be, I'm, I'm guessing a quick one would be, you're probably in the, in the case of an error, you're generating a, you have a different select for that. Is that true? Yes. So if your different select also returned a, um, colon info so you're returning it as organization name if you also select um if if on line 15 if you also generated uh, an additional column uh, organization name as info then that would in other words, return a full output with all of the same variables that you use in in your successful output. Mm -hmm. I'm not right. sure. I'm... Okay, if if you modify line fifteen yep. before the semicolon, add uh, after organization name, yep. or comma, and say at organization name as info. Or as partner ID, I think was your oh, yeah, proper. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Partner as partner ID. ID. All right. But in this case, I would have, there's a bunch of fields in here. I'd have yes. to go and do each one of these fields. Yes. Can, can ah. I jump in for a second? Yeah. Yep. This, is, this is basically my wheelhouse. I, I do stuff like this all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> That ending if statement, where if customer int ID is yep. greater than zero, begin select. What you want to do is you're going to add an else at the end. You're going to do another select. That second select is going to be yep. your hard-coded error message as the ID with your default values for all of the other fields. That's going to guarantee you that whether your customer ID is good or bad, you're yep. going to get the same fields However, on the bad section, your ID will be your error message because that's your default field. Whereas all of your other fields, you can just either make them null, blank, or whatever it is you want to do as the value. 
Make sure. sense? Sort of. Yep. So right at the top, you have that other if statement. If is numeric, yep. that customer ID, and then you have an else. That else you get rid of because that select statement is going to cause you a problem. You don't. You can't have two select statements. So that okay. else block goes away. The else block yeah. on the bottom is the one that's going to handle your error. If your customer ID is not greater than zero, then you're going to jump into your else. You're going to do a full select with all of those same fields, ID, address, yeah. city, all of it. What you want to do is your ID will be that error message. Please refresh your browser. Okay. Or whatever, whatever your default column is. What did you set as your default column? Uh, organization name. All right, so then your organization name is the one that's going to have that please refresh your browser. And all of the other fields, you could just yeah. send no. That'll be a blank. Okay. All right. And that'll guarantee that all of those fields are available so that if you do like what you had just done mm -hmm. and give it a, an invalid one, it's not going to give you a SQL error return. It's going to give you a blank. Right. Okay. I get it. Cool. Thank you. Very nice, Ben. Very nice. Thanks a lot. You, just you, say, you, go ahead. You, I was just going to say, Ben, you much more artfully explained what I was trying to communicate. The, you, you, you're returning the same result set, but under... The only thing I would add is that if you, if you did want to, no matter what, have that message, please refresh your browser, that... Um, you might want to, you know, you could put that value in for, you know, for all of those as the, you know, as what to return if you wanted yeah, to have that. You're, yeah. on that you could, but you have to be careful with that too, because it, if you have like ID is numeric, created right. by is a date, if you mm -hmm. have code that's depending on that value being of a certain data type, you could create errors down the line. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Very good. Thank you. I will uh, play with that. I appreciate it very much. Regardless, I don't want to let Patrick off the hook. So <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Patrick, we uh, we we had this question from Ben about uh, wanting to um, to do something, and I gave. Uh, three answers to to Ben that were uh, essentially the answer to his question. His question was, how do I apply JavaScript to every page on a, a, a standard JavaScript um, script uh, to every mm -hmm. page of my site, to which I gave an answer to that, but you went to the, um, the underlying issue. Maybe that's not a good idea, and it probably isn't a good idea to apply the... the the JavaScript to every page on the site. So you have, anyway, can you? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, um, I'll share my screen and. Uh... Okay, so um, the problem uh, that I, and I'm showing you right here is that, uh, that Ben discovered is that if um, you have a radio box field um, and you have uh, your um, your form is set to uh, be label align top, um, the uh, um, radio box field does not uh, respect that. It doesn't. It, it uh, be, and it has to do with the CSS that's lying behind this. Um, and I'll just quickly show that. Um, just inspect this. Um, basically. Uh, why can't I see my inspector? Move this out of the way. There we go. Um, so I'll just uh, show real quick that the um, did I pull the right one over? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Um, so there it is. Yep. Yeah, uh, the label um, for this. Uh, it, the the problem is is that uh, is that we have uh, two display inline block um, uh, CSS in a row. So um, if we change the label to uh, just block like that, then it works, right? And this is uh, and and Ben came back and said, you know, well, I discovered this is the CSS fix, um, uh, and I have JavaScript to make that work. But um, 
and but I needed to apply it everywhere I have a a um these radio boxes so I uh, but I looked at that and I thought, well, we can actually solve that with CSS. I knew that we could solve it with with um, with a uh, an override CSS. But I will say that I only know enough about CSS to know that I knew I could solve it with CSS. So, as we discussed earlier in the call, and as we are more and more often, um, I went to OpenAI. <laughs> so, and I I basically I I asked a question, and you know, uh, Dale's shown this so many times, um, and. Uh, and uh, it gave me an answer, but it didn't quite do what I wanted to do. It it um it gave me the answer for if I have a uh, a radio box um to assign um the uh, to assign the display property. But then I came back and said, no, that's that's uh that's great, but that's not. I need a little bit more than that. Um, it came back with another answer, and then I said that um, that we're you know not immediately proceeding. So anyway, I got down to the to this is this is what I needed right here. So um, then from there, um, I just went and uh, and did uh, display um, colon block. Um, that was the property I put in here, and we added that to the site to the site CSS, and that corrects the issue. And so that uh, anywhere you have a form that has label aligned top with a, a, a radio box field, um, it will put the correct uh, display property on the label and put your uh, your items below it. And just as a note to everybody, this is not a problem if you uh, don't display hor horizontally. If you display the um, options um, vertically, then uh, the, it, it does respect the uh, the um, label align top property. So that was it. So um, then to clarify your response to me, not necessarily genius. I only knew enough to know okay. that we could solve it with CSS, but I had to find the answer. Like you, I mean, I know CSS, but I don't know CSS. I'm not very good yeah. with it, um, especially when dealing with hierarchical uh, uh you know applications of css that's where it totally fumbles me because i don't know the difference between doing you know a dot label and another dot label or a dot label with a carrot and then something else like i, I don't quite fully understand how that waterfall cascading piece of it fully works right. so half the time i'm just fumbling if it's just a direct application of a of a class I can do that, which is basically what I did. I created a class that overrode the display, and then I had created JavaScript to kind of find all of those labels and then add that class to that label, which fixed it, which was a, a different way of doing it. But yours is obviously much cleaner, much simpler, because I don't have to add my JavaScript to all of the forms. Great. That one CSS corrects it across the entire site. So separately, last week we had a question from somebody with a horizontal checklist, and it was and it looked like this with the um, items all stacked out in kind of a disorganized, just <clears throat> one after the other without um, without any alignment, and they didn't like that layout. Um, the checkbox list has a, and as with all of them, have a uh, UI settings, and there's a style that you can apply. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to pick 35%. But by, and this could also be done in the CSS as well, right? But um, with that change, you get this kind of a, a layout. So you can adjust that 35% to get the thing that you, you want. Anyway, it's just, since we were in the neighborhood, I thought I would throw that in there. All right, with that, we've made it to our hour. So another good session. Thank you all for, since I didn't have anything in my pocket, this was, uh, we, I'm glad we managed to make it through the hour. Um, but uh, we will do it again next week, um, next Friday as well. So uh, thank you for that, and we will see you then. And don't forget, uh, DNN Summit is coming up. So, uh, Mark, can you confirm there's still time, still tickets? Yes, we're still selling tickets right up to the door. 
Excellent. All right. Good deal. All right. Happy low coding. See you next week.